The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. All right, this is part two of the Mega Playoff Podcast, round one. If you missed part one, we had Mike Lombardi and Chad Millman. This is part two. Grantland's Bill Barnwell coming up a little later. We're going a little stat-based. I don't want to steal the numbers, never lie, thunder. But uh, going a little bit number-based. On the phone right now from FootballOutsiders.com, Aaron Schatz, what's happening? Hey, man, you can steal a little bit of the numbers never lie thunder since the show's not on on Tuesday. Yeah, there it is. I'm stealing some thunder. So you're so, replacing it for Tuesday. I looked at your final DVOA ratings, which I really enjoy. Thank I just you. I like seeing it all laid out. I like how you do the weighted so I can see who's the hot team coming down the stretch, all that stuff. The one thing that really jumped out at me. Houston was ranked fifth in your rankings overall. Cincinnati was ranked 17th. Yeah. Cincinnati has only beaten one winning team, 9-7 and seven, Tennessee. Um, they TJ Yates seems like he's going to play this game. I know it's a drop-off from Matt Schaub. Maybe they're not the number five team, but they're still top ten, and yet they're only giving three points in this game at home. Explain this to me. Yeah, you know, I don't know even if top 10, maybe more like 12 or 13, but still, I think Cincinnati, Cincinnati is mediocre. Cincinnati is the prototypical, uh, team that made it in with a couple of good breaks and an easy schedule, although not as easy as we expected it to be, because, um, the NFC West proved to be better than we thought going into the season. San Francisco, yep. of course, especially, but, um, yeah, I mean, listen, Houston's not the fifth best team with TJ Yates at quarterback. But over the course of the season, they were they were the number one team in our ratings when Schaub got hurt. Wow! They were higher than Green Bay when Schaub got hurt, and they had just torn you know torn off like a four game streak of really good games, and then he got hurt. So I I also think that un, uh, unfortunately for us as Patriots fans, that Houston is got a better chance of winning this game than I think people are giving them credit for. Agree. So. That means Pittsburgh's going to New England, and Pittsburgh was number two in your overall rankings. Well, I, then, I certainly think that Cincinnati has a better chance of beating Houston than Denver does of beating Pittsburgh, so it's not definite right. <laughs> that right. Pittsburgh's going to New England. But yeah, Pittsburgh's number two in our in our ratings and in the weighted uh, ratings that show uh, which teams are hotter at the end of the year. Pittsburgh is also number two. Uh, but again, this is another team where the quarterback is a question. They've been down the last two or three weeks uh, when since Roethlisberger got hurt, and I don't quite know how healthy he is. Uh, he hasn't been playing at his, you know, the two games he played while hurt, he was not playing at his usual strength. He clearly, you know, clearly was not as good as he usually is. Do you, if you're looking at both of those games, you would – Obviously, the upset pick, if you had to pick an underdog, would be Cincinnati. Can you make any case whatsoever that Denver can beat Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh? I mean, in Denver. Well, anything can happen. I mean, first of all, the NFL upsets happen all the time. It's possible, especially when you've got a home team. But for them to win, you either would need a couple of ridiculous bounces of the ball, the kind of Tebow magic that we saw Earlier in the season, you know, in the Chicago game and in the Miami game and North Turner, you know, being conservative on the field goal and overtime and all that stuff, you'd either need a couple of those events or Roethlisberger has to have a setback in his injury recovery and be really hurt and really subpar. And that's it. This yeah, I mean, otherwise, bigger... it's Pittsburgh is so much better than Denver. We have Denver 24th and Pittsburgh 2nd. Pittsburgh is the only team in the league that ended the season in the top ten in all three phases of the game. Did Have you ever had a bigger disparity in a round one playoff game than number two versus number 24? Oh, I 24? think that there has been, usually involving the NFC West. 
I was trying to. I'm looking up uh, as we're talking. I'm looking up your final 2010 rankings to see if Seattle was lower than you had Denver 24. Wow. Yeah, I mean they weren't. First of all, that whole division wasn't that good. We ended up with San Diego 16th, which is a little higher than they were for most of the year. Yeah. But we ended up with Oakland 22, Denver 24, and KC 26. It was a bad division. Uh, last year you had Seattle 30th, but New Orleans was 10th. So technically there is a bigger disparity this year with Pittsburgh-Denver. Yeah, this is a pretty big one. And also, There may have been, I'm trying to think, I mean, there may have been the year that Arizona went to the Super Bowl <laughs> because oh, yeah. Arizona's rating was really low that year because, remember, they got destroyed by the Patriots in a snowstorm in Week 16 by like 46 points. Yeah. You look at uh, at round one, the NFC games are so much more interesting. What jumps out? to you with the numbers as you're looking at the matchups for the NFC? Well, I've actually been doing some work on this because I'm uh, writing the NFC playoff previews. Um, One interesting thing uh, about Atlanta and the Giants, Atlanta was the most consistent team of the year. In fact, they were the most consistent team we've ever measured in 20 years. What does that mean? Uh, We take their single game ratings for all 16 games, and when you look at the variance of those single game ratings, they were the most consistent team in the last 20 years. They didn't have great games, and they didn't have bad games. All their games were good. So all that mattered was who they were playing? In a lot of ways, and the Giants were somewhat inconsistent. Not totally inconsistent, but somewhat inconsistent. The Giants played a really hard schedule this year, too. They're better than their record. They played the third hardest schedule in the league by our numbers. I think they played the hardest schedule of any playoff team. And they were also they were a little top-heavy, so that you know, I think if they're if they're at full steam, it's a much different team because you take away like two of those blue chip guys, and suddenly it's a pretty crippled team. And it right, really the same thing. The thing about the Giants is that even when you consider their recent wins, they still had the usual Giants second half collapse. Yep. Yeah. I mean, even when you, even if you do consider their most most recent wins, they're. Um, their pass defense in our ratings went from 12th in the first eight weeks of the se- first nine weeks of the season to 26th in the last nine week- last eight weeks of the season. Ugh. Now, I mean, they got better the last couple weeks in pass defense, but uh, you know they're very dependent on the pass rush, obviously. Um, and Matt Ryan doesn't take a lot of sacks. They were seventh in adjusted sack rate, so yeah. it- it'll be interesting to see if they can get to him. This Atlanta thing's really interesting to me. They're they're like the guy who gets up at five thirty and gets his coffee at five forty five and orders the same coffee every time. Like if they're that consistent. But the weird part of that is usually indoor teams act differently outdoors. Like they don't they it's still pretty consistent indoor outdoor doesn't matter. Yeah, they haven't really if you we look at their home I don't have indoor outdoor in front of me, but I have home road splits and their home road splits were basically what you would expect from any team. Hmm. Now, what about like with the Saints and the fact that I think they played 11 games indoors and they're looking at that San Francisco game in round 2 potentially, which is outdoors, grass, wind, like everything you would think you would need to beat the Saints. Do you think that matters with them? I mean, maybe a little bit. But I think the Saints' home field advantage was probably a little bit overstated. First of all, historically, the Saints don't have a strong home field advantage. If you look at the last 10 years of stats or so, they have one of the worst records at home compared to on the road. Really? Now, obviously, that includes the pre-Breeze years. Mm. But, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not just because of the year that they spent wandering. And then even this year, if we look at the, the DVOA splits home and road, um, their defense was actually about the same at home as it was on the road, which is usually, obviously, the defense is better at home. Now, their, their offense was much better at home than it was on the road. So, I mean, I think it matters a little bit, but San Francisco, is, it's not like San Francisco is freezing. I think the biggest problem is wind. Yeah. And the, the thing is, the Saints have a really good ground game. Now, you know, San Francisco had a really good run defense this year, but the Saints' ground game is, you know, a bit underrated. It's a big part of their offense. Last year you had, in 2010, the weighted DVOA. Pittsburgh was second. Green Bay was third. Both of those teams made the Super Bowl. This year you have Green Bay one, Pittsburgh two, 
New Orleans three. Actually, in the weighted ratings, we have New Orleans one. I'm sorry. I'm looking at that wrong. New Pittsburgh Orleans one, two, Pittsburgh Green two, Bay three. Green Bay three. Okay. And then there's a bit of a tiny drop off. Pats are four. Then Philly is five. Thanks for coming, Philly. Uh, <laughs> do we these this weighted DVA? I don't know how long you've been doing this for, but can you really read something into that heading into January? No, you know, the funny thing is, if you look back historically, the full season rating has actually been about as good as the weighted rating when it comes to predicting the hmm. the playoffs. It really only matters when you have a big difference. And none of these teams have a big difference. The Saints have been a little better in recent weeks, in the last eight weeks, than they were in the first eight. The Green Bay was a little bit better in the first eight than they were in the last eight. But it's only when you have a big difference that it really matters. There is a big difference with Pittsburgh because that week one game was such an aberration. Yep. But then you have the asterisk of we don't know how healthy Big Ben is. I mean, that's the thing about Pittsburgh. We just don't know how healthy their quarterback is. Every team is flawed this year. Yep. I agree. In fact, that. I think the team with the, the sort of the least flawed team is Baltimore. But even they, first of all, their special teams are lousy. And second of all, it's not like they're great on offense they're kind of good on offense and yeah there i guess there's some questions about the quarterback and um but you know you have the three teams that are terrible on defense green bay new orleans and new england you have the teams with quarterback questions houston and pittsburgh uh and then you know you have the teams that are pretty good but not great in any way which i think would be baltimore atlanta and the giants and we always like looking at the special teams heading into the playoffs because it's the part of the game everybody always forgets. There's two bad special teams in the playoffs this year. You have Baltimore ranked 30th. You have Detroit ranked 29th. Yes. Does that come back to haunt those teams in one of these first two rounds? It may, you know, if they give up a big uh, return. Detroit's been pretty poor in kick coverage on both kicks and punts. Um Baltimore has been pretty poor all around, except for maybe punt returns. They've only been a little bit below average. And it also depends who they face. San Francisco has been awesome on special teams this year, especially yes. punting. Andy Lee is a great punter. New England has been very good, uh, particularly kicking and punting and on kick and punt coverage, not really on returns. Yeah, because we waved Brandon Tate. So it's less exciting. It's more exciting to have a team that's really good on returns, but the field position from that good kick and punt coverage doesn't matter. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm looking at it. It doesn't seem like there's any huge disparity. Like last year, I remember Seattle was like two or three and New Orleans was in the mid-20s or something. And it yeah, I mean, like if that. San Francisco were to play Detroit, there'd be a big disparity. Yeah. New England plays Baltimore. There's been a bit of a disparity. Otherwise, not really. Pick, pick a round one upset for me without falling back on the whole anything can happen excuse. I want you to pick one. If you're, Atlanta. If you're life dependent on it. Atlanta. Atlanta. Mm. Yeah, this isn't this isn't looking good for Giants fans because everybody is so confident that after last week that now they're just going to roll through. Yeah, that's people have a short for people have a short memory span. It, it always happens in the playoffs. People remember the previous week's game and think, you know, Rich Gannon had two games, he's unstoppable, and then he gets yeah. stopped. Peyton Manning's had two great games, he's unstoppable, and then he gets stopped. Um, first of all, if you want to have a short attention span, Atlanta was even better than the Giants were last week. Although yeah. it helped that Tampa Bay didn't actually show up. Yeah. But, but for the season, we have Atlanta better than the Giants. If you consider the way that the Giants faded in the second half, Atlanta looks better than them. So if we're going to pick a, an upset, I would definitely go with Atlanta. And then looking forward for the Super Bowl, you mentioned that the three, te the three teams that everybody has as the favorites also have the three of the worst defenses in the playoffs – is there, let's say, is there any historical um, whatever to the two teams with two of the worst defenses meeting in the Super Bowl? They are the three worst defenses in the playoffs, actually. They weren't the three worst defenses in the league this year. That's um, what I meant, yeah. I'll give you two sort of historical uh, similarities. The first is 1983 when Oakland and Washington had poor defenses and met it in the Super Bowl. Okay. Uh, the Raiders' defense wasn't as bad as the Redskins. The Redskins were very much like, uh, uh, they gave up a lot of yards, but they didn't. But they had a ridiculous turnover differential, so they didn't give up that many points. 
um, the Raiders had a better defense than the Redskins did, but the others would be 2006 Colts. I mean, the 2006 Colts were a terrible defense, and then suddenly in the playoffs, they completely turned things around. They got a player back, Bob Sanders. None of these teams are getting a player back any near that level. Yeah. The only one of these teams that can kind of say they're adding a player that will improve their defense is the Patriots because they're going to get Chung. They got Chung back this week, and I'm assuming Brandon Spikes as well. But those guys mm-hmm. are not Bob Sanders. Um, but the Colts' defense just blew everything we knew about how you win in the playoffs out of the water because they just played. The defense was totally different in the in the playoffs uh, for the first two games, at least against the Patriots. Their defense was not good, but you know it was a shootout, and the Colts won. So I mean, there is a precedent. The other thing I would say is these defenses were not this bad in 2010, in particular the Packers. So it's not hard to see a situation where the Packers' defense plays better during the playoffs than they did in the regular season because they do have most of the same players that they had the year before. And while the pass rush isn't as strong, certainly, as it was the year before, you know, Tremont Williams and Sam Shields could play better than they did during the regular season. They could play closer to what they did in 2010. You can see it. And the the big injury for the Pats, which really hurt them, was DeAndre Carter. And I, I didn't feel like it got enough attention, or maybe it did, and I just didn't see people talk about it on the radio. It got shows, plenty of attention out here, certainly. Yeah, in Boston, I'm sure it did. But um, they had the semblance of at least they were rushing the passer. Right. And Mark and Anderson, Anderson, Mark Anderson yeah. is still rushing the passer, but he's much more of That's a it. pass rush specialist, whereas Andre yes. Carter could play all downs and rush the passer when they went to pass on a first and ten. Yep. They were getting consistent pressure, and now it's basically up to Mark Anderson and blitzes, which scares me a little bit. This uh, this Pittsburgh game, which is looming in round two if Houston takes care of business, um, I can only imagine how people back home are reacting. Oh, they will. They will. They will. It will be doom and gloom. It will absolutely be doom and gloom. Um, because people are so obsessed with the idea that the Patriots have lost their first playoff game for the last two years. Mm. Now, listen, the fact is they weren't really a better team than Baltimore two years ago. So that's really one upset. <laughs> right. You know, the Jets upset. It's not, it's not a streak. Um, and if they lose to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh was kind of a slightly better team than them this year, too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, these things happen. That being said... One game does not determine the next game. You know, Baltimore blew Pittsburgh out in the first game of the season. The second time they met, it was much closer. I'm guessing the second time Pittsburgh and New England meet, if they do meet, it will be much closer. And we don't know what Ben Roethlisberger health is. If he can't throw the ball as well, then they're not finding the holes in the zone as well. But certainly the Patriots would. Patriots fans are more scared to see Pittsburgh than any other team until you get to the Super Bowl. Last question. Could you make the case – that this 2011 Patriots offense is better at this specific point in time of the year than the 2007 Patriots were? Um, I guess you can make the case. Over the course of the season, they're not. Right. I'm saying right now, on first week of January, heading into round one, do you like this Patriots offense at least comparably to that 07 Patriots? I'm not sure they're better than this Patriots offense was last year at this time. So you're you're saying better or worse? I think they're about the same. I mean, it's pretty much the same guys. Yeah. Um, I like I like this offense. They've declined more just a little because... bit in the last couple of weeks, but then again, they've had the offensive line injuries in the last couple of weeks. Right. Yeah, that is. Mankins isn't coming back, right? Uh, no, as yeah. far as I know, they're expecting them him back. If not this week, next. Uh, if sorry, not this week because they're not playing. I, as far as I know, they're expecting him back. All right. I hope that's true. Yeah, I like this Pats team a little more just because. It, the, the Gronkowski, Hernandez, Welker, any third down, just seems like we have three places to go. I also think they can run the like in 07, once Sammy Morris got hurt, it was down to Lawrence Baroni and Kevin Falk as the running backs. Lawrence Baroni yeah, like barely the Saints, belonged like in the, the league. Saints, like the Saints, although not to the same extent, the Patriots are a much better running team than people realize. Yeah. Hey, Ridley actually was pretty good, I thought. I felt like down the stretch. Ellis is solid. He's not. You won't tell your grandkids about him, but he's solid. And then, uh, I don't know. It just seems like offensively, I feel like they have Woodhead is the guy on draw. Yeah. I will say this. I will say this. You know, we, we now get to the very specific Patriots fan part of the podcast. So everybody who hates yes. the Patriots, you 
can f- forward for about a minute here. But I really hope we do not get ourselves into a situation in which the Patriots make the Super Bowl, lose, and then all we have to hear is the rending of garments and the screaming and the wailing for two months about how Belichick can't win Super Bowls anymore because they've lost their second straight Super Bowl. <laughs> the Packers right now look like a better team. The Saints right now look like a better team. I, as a Patriots fan, with Roethlisberger's injury, I must say I have some confidence they'll make it to the Super Bowl, but they shouldn't be yeah. favored in the Super Bowl. No. Green Bay and New Orleans are the favorites to win the Super Bowl right now. And Patriots fans should not think there's something wrong with Bill Belichick if this team loses to Green Bay and New Orleans. Aaron, this is why it's so great to live in Los Angeles. I've removed myself from all this doom and gloom. <laughs> Stay as I just far away from against... Dan Shaughnessy as possible at all times. <laughs> He wrote a column a couple days ago that was like, boy, we're all so excited about the 13-3 record. This team will lose its first playoff game. Absolutely. Yeah. See, I don't have There's to no, no that question stuff. this team will lose its first playoff game. Even if I just that game is the Cincinnati, Dan, come on. Yeah. I just watch the games and enjoy them. And so now that we have the two radio stations going head-to-head, it's in, and then all these shows, it just seems like I, I see Comcast and Nesson. Like every moment of the day, there's two sports writers arguing. Uh, Boston the, is a sports media freakout. It's, it's unbelievable. It's really yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. We can talk about that next week. Aaron Schatz, we will check out your football preview on footballoutsiders.com Thursday and Friday. Friday, playoff previews will go up Friday, definitely. Um, but there's lots of good stuff during the week. And, and numbers never lie. Numbers you're, never you're lie. Wednesday Emmy Award winning performances. Yeah, all right. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Sounds good, man. All right. Let's take it over to the city of sin. In Las Vegas, Grantland.com zone, Bill Barnwell, what is happening? God, it's, uh, you know, right after New Year's, and Vegas is kind of like, you know, when you, know when you throw a party and, and, and it's the next morning and you're there and it's just like everything reeks of beer and there's tons mm. of people here who are just hung over and walking around like zombies. Uh, that's yeah. kind of what Vegas is like the, the first few days after New Year's. And it must have been the best gambling frenzy that, that we've had since you moved there because you had all the NFL games on January 1st, then you had all the college bowl games yesterday, and then on top of that, you're having 12 NBA games a night, and then you have the playoff futures and the round one lines, all that stuff. It's a pretty fun time for a sports book. You know, I, I'd like to say that, but uh, I, I got harmed yesterday with uh, my, my tight ends two and a half bet. Uh, that, that was one of the worst losses I think I've ever taken as far as a better, uh, uh, you know, to be probably 99% to cover uh, with the Titans running the clock out and fumbling with a minute and a half left and the Texans who aren't even trying to win, who could care uh, less about winning that game, scoring a touchdown, and then going for two. That, that, that was pretty painful. And then going for two and not, then you have no overtime. Yeah, you, you, you have no possibility of winning the bet. And, I mean, it, it's just... You know, literally, you know, they put in, Jake DeLone was in there. TJ H could have come back in, and they kept in Jake DeLone. I mean, that's just, it's pretty incredible to lose that. But uh, that's been the story of this year in Vegas, I think, has been, uh, the over-unders went well. We'll write about that tomorrow on Grantland, but uh, the weekly bets, not so much. Yeah, if you're laying less than three points, what was it, what was the Titans line, three? It was two and a half for most of the week. I think it hit two maybe on Sunday, but it was it was under three, yeah. If you're laying three points or less in a game where an ice cold Jake Delhomme comes running in to save the day, you're feeling pretty good. <laughs> of you're, course, you're, and you think you're you know, spending the money mentally already. Yeah, you know, of course. I, 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 my, my ticket, I had that circled on my sheet of paper for uh, for victory. But uh, you know, uh, the, the Texans were subbing out guys. They had their backup offensive linemen in. Their top three or four players were inactive. I mean, mm. it, it could have been a smarter decision to make that bet, and it looks great. Uh, for the first 59 minutes uh, and 30 seconds of the game. And then Jake DeLome, of all people, Jake DeLome had to come in mm. and, and ruin my fun. Yeah, and then on top of it, threw a, the, the game seemingly tying touchdown pass to a Johnson, who was an Andre Johnson. I thought for a second I was going to win my Andre Johnson bet. Uh, we just had your old boss, Aaron Schatz, on the, uh, on the podcast breaking down some numbers. We're talking about round one. Is there just looking at the matchups, the spreads, the numbers that you've seen? Is there a round one matchup that jumps out to you as a good value matchup? Well, you know, I, really, I, I think the biggest one that stands out to me, and I, I don't know which side to take, but I think there's value on one of the sides, is uh, Pittsburgh Denver. You know, uh, the, the, the comparison you think about is to the 
uh, Seahawks Saints game last year, where really, you know, no one gave the Seahawks a chance to win. Uh, you know, people couldn't find a way that the Seahawks were better than the Saints, but they had a huge home field advantage, and uh, you know, they were they were getting ten points, and, and and the Denver line I think right now is at eight, and it's going to rise. It's at nine offshore. So it might hit ten by by Sunday. It'll either be eight eight or nine or nine and probably about nine and a half. And I mean, you know, Tim Tebow's there, right? Like there has to be some kind of benefit to having, uh, you know, someone who clearly is going to be extremely motivated and and desperate to win after losing last week. What do you what do you make of the Steelers team limping into the playoffs with the injuries they've had with what you've seen? You know, it never strikes me as like. Uh, something that's essential. I, I, I really don't think you have to be a dominant team the, past, the last few weeks to make it, uh, you know, to really, really dominate in the playoffs. Uh, last year, obviously, the Packers went on a hot streak at the end of the year and ended up riding that to the Super Bowl. But then you think about the Saints, where, you know, the Saints were, what, 13 and 0, and they lost to the Cowboys, and then they lost, I think, to the Buccaneers, too. Uh, really limped into the playoffs, then they were great. You know, uh, I, I think for every example of a team that you know, goes in there hot and, and is motivated, you know, seems like they're playing their best football, uh, you probably can find a counterexample of a team that really didn't look that good in the final few weeks of the year and then stepped up. Uh, you know, for the Steelers, uh, I wrote about, about it today for Grant Lynn about Richard Mendenhall. Uh, I, I just don't see it making a huge difference for them, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, what he's done for the team this year. He's not averaging an impressive number of yards per carry. You, you know, if you watch Richard Mendenhall, do you ever think, Wow, this guy is such a dominant back. I'd be terrified to play against him if I was a, you know, a, a Patriots fan. He, I, I really don't think anyone's ever seen that this year. I mean, he's just not that guy. And I think we were kind of expecting him to take a big boost uh, and, and really take a step forward this year, and he just hasn't done that. So uh, it doesn't strike me as a big deal. I think Ben Roethlisberger will be a little healthier. Uh, I think the biggest injury for me is Ryan Clark because Ryan Clark, yeah. uh, you know, can't play in Denver, and and I mean he he's been. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say better than Troy Polamalu this year, but uh, he's certainly been, you know, right up to that caliber as far as, uh, you know, Polamalu slipped a bit and Clark's playing a little better. And, I mean, you know, he, he can play because of, of his illness, and that's pretty remarkable. You're going to have to, you know, lose one of your best defensive players. Uh, it really strikes me as, as something I'd be worried about from the Steelers' perspective. And you look at the Steelers. I, I don't want to make the case for the Broncos because I, I just – they were, they've been so bad the last couple of weeks. It's really tough of them. You know, they need the Eddie Royal kick return touchdown. They need so, at least one turnover inside Pittsburgh's 20. They need, you know, one kind of su- pseudo fluky offensive play, I think. But you just look at this Pittsburgh, just the season they've had, because they were 12 and 4, and, and you, you know, comparing them to Green Bay, New Orleans, doing them, things like that. Roethlisberger threw for 4,000 yards. 21 touchdowns, 14 picks, had a 90 QB rating, was sacked 40 times. Like in this day and age, not not really the most spectacular uh, offensive season for a quarterback. Then you, you mentioned Mendenhall. Now he's out. Now you're looking at Isaac Redman and Moel De Moore. Isaac Redman, 110 carries, 4.4 yards per carry. Hmm, not that great. Then you look at the receivers, the Mike Wallace, Antonio Brown, obviously the heart of the team. Both of those guys had over 1,100 yards. Heath Miller, not a great year. 631 yards, 75 catches for him. You know, pretty average, maybe a little below average. Hein Ward's only caught uh, 46 – I'm sorry, Heath Miller caught 51 passes. Uh, Heinz Ward, 46 catches for 381 yards. Nobody else caught more than 23 balls. This is the kind of offense that could – submit like a 13 point game in my high right oh for sure you know you think about you know you, you get those numbers but where the weakness i think really is and why those guys all really didn't have great years was because the offensive line just isn't very good yeah. you know uh you, you talk about a team that already has you know ben Roethlisberger at, at less than 100 percent. he can't you know scramble around he has that that high ankle sprain he's definitely limited uh as far as his mobility and then you have a line that just has, hasn't been that good for years and, and really struggled this year. Uh, you know, Marquise Pouncey has a high ankle sprain as well. Uh, he's been recovering, but he's still not 100%. And, uh, you know, they're going to play a Broncos team where uh, you're playing against Elvis Stumerville and Von Miller. I mean, Von Miller has definitely had struggled the past few weeks, and it seems like he's kind of hit the rookie wall if that exists. But, you know, that's a great pass rush. And when you have a mediocre offensive line and you have – Two great pass rushers and a quarterback who can't get out of the way. I mean, 
you have to think that the, the, the Steelers are going to struggle to really, you know, get the ball downfield to Wallace and, and, and make those big plays. I mean, I, I think their offense is kind of, you know, they can do some trick stuff and line up guys in those trip sponge formations and, and, you know, run some pick plays. And that'll work here and there. But I think, the, you know, the way they win this game is they have to make big plays downfield to Wallace and to Sanders and, and to Antonio Brown. And I don't know if they can do that. If, if they don't think they're going to have the time to pull that off, I don't think Ben Roethlisberger is going to be able to make the time. And I think that the offensive line won't be able to hold up long enough for, uh, you know, to, to keep Millis and Dumerville off of Roethlisberger. So you're feeling if this line gets over 10, you're starting to think about Denver a little bit. Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I will probably take Denver anyway. But over 10, I think it goes from being, you know, uh, probably a play I'd likely consider to being a really strong play. And, and again, I mean, think about, you know, think about the Seahawks last year. You know, what case could you really have made for the Seahawks winning last year? I mean, wouldn't it be just as flimsy as the case that you would have to make for the Broncos right now? It was a slightly better case, but not an equally bad case. At least with them, you had this, they had a special teams advantage. They had mm-hmm. Hasselbeck, who had at least been in this, and had played in a big game before, and you had home field. For Denver, it seems like it's just basically home field and. They can play that ball control, keep it low, seven to three, ten to three type game, and then their pass rush, which as we you just said, Von Miller hasn't been the same guy now for about really since he has the cast, and mm-hmm. it's not the same pass rush that they had mid season. Yeah. Um, other than that, Champ Bailey, Champ Bailey shuts down Mike Wallace. Yeah, that he could has happen. Bigger. I mean, you know, uh, you're, you're, Champ's going to just step up. It's probably his last big game as a. Uh, you know, uh, uh, as an above-average cornerback, but the, the, the Broncos do have Matt Prater, who is a you know pretty good kicker. Certainly, they're not going to have yeah. the, the advantage that the Seahawks had, but you know, certainly, I'd rather it come down to Prater kicking a, a 55-yard field goal than Swisham. I actually thought that was their biggest mistake in that Chiefs game. They had a chance to kick like a 56-yarder, and they punted, and the guy, of course, put it in the end zone. It was in the first half, I think, second quarter, mm-hmm. and it would have and. It's just weird. Like, how many how many fifty plus field goals does Prater have to make in Mile High? Like, it's just be automatic. You send them out. I don't know what they were thinking, but uh, it turns out they needed those three points in the in the last couple of drives. But I agree with you. If so, we're saying if this line gets to ten and a half, the th- this could absolutely be a sixteen to six, sixteen to seven, thirteen to seven type game. Right? Oh, for sure. And you know, it, it could be forty five to three. It could be a blowout, but. Uh, you know, I, I, I just think that the Broncos' defense is good enough. Their special teams are good enough. And, I mean, you know, Tebow's in there. I mean, at some point, you know, we have to account for the fact that Tebow's going to slow down the game. He's going to, uh, you know, run the ball effectively. I don't think the Steelers have a fantastic run defense this year by any means. And who knows? I, I mean, you know, when you have a home team in the playoffs and they're getting that many points, I, I, you know, if you look at, the, against the spread records this year, I think home dogs that are 10 points or more are 8-0 and this year. The Rams wow. came in against the 49ers uh, in Week 17. They were down like 21 points and yep. came back to cover. Uh, so, you know, you, you just have, it, it, it seems like an obvious mismatch, but 10 points are a lot. Here's the other interesting thing about the Steelers. If you just look at their schedule. They, it looks like they've played five really good games this year. The Seattle in week two, they shut them out. Tennessee in week five, 38 to 17, killed them. Uh, New England was a 25 17 final, but they dominated that game, and I thought mm-hmm. they played really well in that game. Cincinnati, week 13, 35 to 7. St. Louis, week 16, 27 to nothing, but anybody who's half decent is going to beat St. Louis by 20 points. It's not like this team has been rolling off, you know, kick-ass performances because they've been really banged up. Right. So, you know, I, I mean, even those performances you listed, some of them, you know, the numbers didn't quite match up. The Patriots were, I think, were the best win they had this year as far as you yes. know, their actual level of performance. But the Seahawks game, that was a different Seahawks team. A lot of young players really, you know, kind of coalesced during the second half of the Seahawks, and they were a much different team to me, at least, in the second half. And, and that Bengals game, that 35-7 game, I remember very well because I was uh, Steelers minus seven was like one of my biggest plays of the year for you know personally and uh, I, I felt like I got lucky you know the Bengals you know drove uh, drove down the field you know for a field goal and 
put it through and then had like a delayed game penalty or a timeout or something, and then the second shot of it got blocked. Uh, you know, the Steelers, they, like Brandon Tate fumbled a kickoff. The Steelers had like basically three or four possessions that started in Bengals territory, and that kind of, you know, blew up the game in the first half, and the Bengals couldn't throw to catch up. Uh, you know, there, there really isn't like, like, like outside of the Patriots game, there's not that, that win where you remember thinking, wow, you know, the, the Steelers are a team I really want to get behind in the playoffs. But here they're, they are, they're the Steelers. Here are their road games this year. They got killed in Baltimore. They barely beat the Colts. They lost to Houston by seven. They beat Arizona by 12, but even that wasn't that impressive of a win. They beat Cincy by seven. They beat Casey by four. They beat Cleveland by 11 in a game that Cleveland was in until that, you know, and then Colt McCown, he got concussed. He came back, the whole thing. They got killed in San Fran 20 to three. That was a weird game. They barely beat Cleveland in week 17. They won by four. That's not a great road team. Yeah, I mean the one, the, the first McCoy game was the was actually a home game. Uh, the, the concussion game with. McCoy. Oh, I screwed that up. Yeah, I shouldn't have mentioned that. Uh, okay. Yeah, that was a home game. So let's throw that one out. So yeah. yeah. So their last. I mean, there, there's there's no great performance on the road that we're missing here. I mean, you know, they're just, uh, you know, they're, they're just. I, I don't know that they're that great of a football team. They played a really easy schedule. Uh, you know, and I, I mean, every time they played. A really good football team, outside of maybe the Patriots, which you know we may have different opinions how great they are. Mm. Uh, you know, I they were either they won a close game or or they kind of you know weren't in it. I mean, the, the Ravens and the 49ers games are pretty damning as far as uh, uh, you know what they can do against a dominant team on the road. Even if we think okay, they beat the Broncos. I mean, you know, it's kind of hard to bet on them going forward as far as the future side of things. Five and three on the road, only won one game by double digits. It's a pretty good sign for the for the Broncos to at least keep it close. What what are Roethlisberger's injuries? I I lost track. <laughs> what does he have? He, so he has a high ankle sprain, knee knee. Like what's going on with him? I can't even remember. I think the high ankle sprain is the biggest one. I, I think this was kind of the year of the high ankle sprain because you had all these guys, yeah. you know, get high ankle sprains and it was all oh, they'll come back next week, they'll be fine. And then you know, Sam Bradford missed three weeks, came back, you know, had another high ankle sprain and basically missed the rest of the year. Uh, Ossie Andrew had Peterson. one. Who, who had one? Osi. Oh, yeah, he Didn't did he have one? one. That's right. And he just came back last night. He was actually really good, or on Sunday, and he was really good. Uh, he actually, was, that's uh, a good uh, segue, because we need to oh. talk about the Giants, because that's your team. For sure. A little too many was, people uh, believing in it. I was pretty impressed. You know, I, oh. I, I, was, I was expecting them to lose. I, I will say, as a Giants fan, as a better... You know, I, I mean, I, I wrote that that column on the Giants quitting on Tom Coughlin and struggling in the second half, and you know, I, I fully expected them to lose each of the past two weeks, and I was pleasantly surprised that they were able to not only get a couple breaks, but then also play really well, especially on, on defense, and uh, and pull it out. But now you're in the situation that you hate being in a Giants fan, where everybody now kind of believes in this team a little bit, thinks they're going to beat Atlanta in round one, they're a Super Bowl sleeper. This is not where you want to be during the Tom Coughlin era. No, not at all. It, it, it is a, a immediate, you know, impending sign of doom. Uh, you're right under, under Tom Coughlin. Uh, you know, I, I got to say, uh, I, I've been very surprised the past couple of weeks. You know, I, I thought that the Jets and the Cowboys would each have a very simple game plan. I thought it was going to be, you know, we're going to throw downfield. We're going to try and throw at Aaron Ross because we know he's not a NFL quality cornerback. And even if we throw an interception, we're going to get a bunch of completions and a bunch of pass interference penalties. So I'm going to watch the tape pretty hard this week. I kind of want to see what the Giants are doing, whether it's the pass rush, whether it's just that they played Mark Sanchez and an injured Tony Romo. You know, what's happening to prevent teams from throwing deep against Aaron Ross? Because, you know, if I think about what the Falcons are going to do to try to attack them, I mean, it makes total sense for them to, uh, you know, just go deep with Julio Jones against Aaron Ross and, you know, try and beat the guy downfield. Shot said before uh, you came on that in all the time they've measured uh, DVOA week by week for a team, the Falcons were the single most consistent team they had ever measured from week to really? week. Really? Yeah. What does that mean? I think it means that we know what to expect from the Falcons. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. Like, like they don't feel like a, that, like that consistent of a team. I know. I was shocked. But I guess that means it's, they, they're just going to – Go up and down depending on what team they're playing. 
And it kind of makes right. sense when you think about it because, like, they played pretty well in that Packers game and they lost by 11. They played well in the Bucks game and they won by 40. Like, it, it does kind of make sense, but then it makes you think, like, this Giants team is Jekyll and Hyde. And you know what you're getting from Atlanta. So it all depends on what whether Jekyll or Hyde shows up. Exactly. Uh, which I, I, don't, I don't know how to handicap that, strangely. Yeah. You know uh, what it is? That, it's a stay away, Bill Burnwell. That, thank, thank you for your your stage betting advice with the extra years. It's a years stay away. Stuff. Stay it's away. Stay right. away. I, but, but as a football fan, you know, I, th- I think, again, I don't want to harp on the same thing, but I think the biggest matchup is Giants defensive line versus Falcons offensive line. Uh, they yeah. really... You know, they've had some issues there. Joe Hawley, who plays guard for them, is, is probably one of the worst regular starters in football as far as offensive linemen go, at least on, you know, on a successful team. And, uh, you know, they, they had Sam Baker, who they drafted in that famous, you know, uh, I think it was the 07 or 08 draft with Matt Ryan and Curtis Lofton, you know, as far as the, the you know, two perennial, you know, excellent players. And Joe, Sam Baker has kind of got lumped in as the third guy. He's kind of the Chris Bosch of that group, you know, got lumped in as third guy, but he's actually a lot worse than Chris Bosch. I, I'm being... A little harsh on Chris Bosch there, but he, uh, uh, you know, got benched this year. He, he just hasn't been a, a dominant left tackle, and, and he's not playing left tackle anymore. So, you know, uh, uh, you talk about Jason Pierre-Paul and Justin Tuck, and if O.C. Uh, Umanior is healthy, I, I think there's going to be some serious issues with the Falcons, you know, keeping Matt Ryan upright. The uh, Lions-Saints, everybody thinks it's going over. Do you have an opinion on this? I, you know, I'm always inclined to kind of fade the public view. You know, if the public thinks the game is just going to go over, 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 points, 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 you know, I'm, I'm inclined to be contrarian and go under. But I, I just can't imagine watching that game and having the under slip in my hand and thinking, oh, yeah, this is going to be fine. You know, they're not going to score every single possession. I, I mean, you know, it's it just why would either of those teams stop anybody? I mean, look at what, what Max Flynn did to the Lions last week. You know, it, not, not only was it, was it, you know, 400 whatever yards and six touchdowns, it wasn't even a hard 400 plus yards and six touchdowns. It wasn't like he was, you know, doing the Aaron Rodgers thing where he, you know, or, or, or the Tom Brady thing where he flips it up to his tight end who's in double coverage and he makes a great catch. Like it was open receivers for 400 plus yards. So, you know, I, I don't know what the Lions are, are doing at defense, but it really feels like their pass defense just isn't there from a, you know, from that Saints game on, from the second half of the Packers game, and then from that Saints game on, even after Sue got back, it feels like their pass defense is pretty weak. And looking at the Super Bowl, I know you're not high in the Pats. Doesn't sound like either of us are that high in the Steelers. I think I've I, I think I've done a 180 on that as this two-hour podcast went along. Uh, yeah. I know I don't like Joe Flacco. Oh, so who the hell comes out of the AFC? I can't figure it out. So then, if you don't have that faith in the AFC, would you take the, you know, the generic NFC AFC bet with NFC at four and a half? I think you'd have to think about it. Uh, Chad and I, in part one, we talked about how that's probably the best future bet you can make if you feel really strongly about it because it really does shift like four, four and a half points. I think that was even at one point this year, that AFC NFC bet. I think going into the season, it might have, the AFC might have even been favored by a point. And now it's NFC by four and a half. I think that goes to six. Right. I mean, you know, certainly it, it feels like like your odds of getting a dominant team are better in the NFC just because, you know, maybe there right. isn't a great team in the AFC. Like, I, I really feel like, you know, there's a much better shot that you end up with, uh, you know, Green Bay versus, uh, not maybe not Denver, but Green Bay versus Pittsburgh again, as opposed to, you know, I, I really think the odds are pretty slim that you're going to end up with, you know, the Falcons playing the Patriots or the Falcons playing the Ravens where you would think, wow, I really wish I had been on the AFC on that side. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it really feels like, you know, maybe what? I mean, if you had to do a power poll, you know, how, how many teams off the top, uh, you know, of the NFL are, are in the NFC as far as the best teams in the league? If I'm doing a power poll right now, I have Green Bay, New Orleans, one and two in some order. I'd have to study it. I do. I love the way New Orleans is playing, but I do think that yeah, that San Fran game would worry me if I'm a Saints fan. It just seems like yeah, that's the right kind of team to beat them. But I'd probably have the Pats three by default. But I the Niners, 
nobody's talking about it. It's much more fun to talk about these other teams. The Niners are just kind of sitting there, and if, if they, they can play the nobody believes in us card better than anybody. You know Harbaugh's playing it right now. Nobody's talking about us. We're an afterthought. Meanwhile, they have a bye week, and they've been as consistent as just about anybody this season. Sure, and so. I mean, you know, what, what they do well is subtle. I mean, they play dominant run defense, and they have, you know, maybe the best special teams uh, of the past 20 years as far as, uh, right. you know, what they can do with David Akers and Andy Lee. I mean, they have just, you know, they're going to have an enormous advantage anywhere they go in special teams, even against, you know, the Bears, against any, any team in football. Uh, you know, especially if they can get, if they have healthy, healthy players, and, and they they've been resting players for the past few weeks. I, I kind of see them as like, you know, a supercharged version of the Cardinals. You know, from a couple of years ago, where the Cardinals kind of clinched in week eight or week nine, and they struggled a little bit, and everyone kind of forgot about them, and then they played well in the playoffs. They got a pretty easy slate, and you know, they ended up having to play the Eagles at home in the uh, NFC Championship game, and, and they won. And you know, if, if for some reason the Packers get knocked off in the second round, which you know, it's the playoffs, anything is possible. Uh, you know, the Niners certainly have a shot at, at, at you know, ha- having a pretty easy shot at the Super Bowl. And then even if they go through and it's Packers and Niners in the NFC Championship game, you know, the stat I, I put up in my column after the Packers lost, I think it's pretty dramatic, is that, you know, o- over the course of that entire 19-game winning streak, the Packers forced a takeaway in every single game. And, and the last time they had, you know, failed to force a takeaway was their last loss, which was against the Patriots with Matt Flynn in that game. That was yep. the last time they'd, they'd failed to, you know, get a turnover. And I think if you don't give the Packers defense turnovers, you'll start them to death. And, and, and if there's anything that the 49ers do well, it's that Alex Smith does not turn the ball over. Uh, they don't fumble. They don't throw interceptions. And they play great field position. So, uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to say that the Niners should, are likely to win the NFC. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think they should be favored against the Packers. But they're the exact sort of team that I think would be able to beat the Packers. Yeah, the, Mike Lombardi talked about this in part one. It's that Super Bowl Forty Two recipe, mm-hmm. and they do a lot of that. The other thing that's interesting with the Niners, I, they finished at 380 points for the season, which was well below. New Orleans had 547, Green Bay had 560, the Pats had 513. But Akers had one of the freakiest field goal seasons, you know, of anybody. And if you just look at it at like scoring drives. Like they were always putting up points on the board as the game went along, you know. They were always, they were always over midfield or right around midfield, and they always had the ball. And it just seemed like that's the type of 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 strategy that's going to beat the Packers and or the Saints. Just the oh yeah, just, you know, the, the, oh, the, can't the, we get the ball back? Damn it! Ah, oh, they had ah, oh, now they're over the forty. Ah, oh, here comes Acres again, and then all of a sudden it's the fourth quarter. Yeah, you know, they're, they're going to have six, seven minute drives. They're going to be able to run the ball well. They're going to protect Alex Smith. They're not going to, he's never going to be in third and eight. You're never going to be in that situation where, you know, Clay Matthews is going to have just, just total free reign to run at you as, as a pass rusher. And, uh, you know, they're going to avoid making stupid decisions. And then, you're right. I mean, they're going to kick a ton of field goals with Akers. They're not going to, you know, try and be super aggressive. And, and their defense, you know, inherits some of the best field position in football because, Andy Lee is there. So you're always going to be taking over, uh, you know, inside your own 20. You're never going to have a short field to work with. And, you know, for all Aaron Rodgers can do, I mean, we know he's fantastic at throwing deep and, and making big plays, but Niners have a pretty good pass rush. And, and we know that there's injuries on that Packers offensive line. I mean, you don't want to project four weeks into the future and say, okay, they're going to be healthy or, or still be injured. But, you know, uh, both their tackles are hurt right now. Uh, you know, there, there's injuries in the middle of the line. I mean, they could be walking wounded heading into, into that game against, you know, Alton Smith and a very good pass rush. So, uh, All right, so I, I, I give you – I don't want to go nuts, but I, I would probably take Niners if it was – if it was like four and a half or five and a half, I think I'd take Niners there. Yeah, the, the shame of it is I wish the Niners were like 20 to 1. I would mm-hmm. jump on it. That's a good long shot bet. But 12 to 1 is kind of what they should be because they'd have to win three times. They're going to be he- heavy underdogs in round three. And probably getting at least, what do we think, that Saints-Niners round two line, Saints at Niners. Saints will be favored by like three and a half or four. You really think guessing. so? Yeah. They'd, Saints, would, Saints would be favored by at least three, I think. I don't know. I, I, know I, I would take Niners three and a half there for sure. I think I would too. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at, I, you know, we, we – 
we shouldn't have talked about the Niners this long without mentioning Alex Smith. Contractually, we were obligated to mention him. <laughs> uh, they didn't, I, I thought today that the Niners are rumored to be offering Alex Smith a, a three-year extension. Uh, uh, the beat guy there was talking about what Alex Smith is likely going to make, and, and it would be a three-year deal for like $11 million a year. What, what, what would the odds have been on Alex Smith getting $11 million a year from somebody two years ago? And who else is paying him that? I don't, I don't know. They're, they're bidding I, I, against I themselves. Right. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where they're the only team that's interested in Alex Smith, and they're the only team that can really offer him that much money. So why would you offer him that? I mean, I, I, I just can't see that personally. But uh, Alex Smith, uh, 17 touchdowns, five picks, 90.7 QB rating, threw for 31.50. Five picks, pretty good, considering it's not like he had the all-time greatest uh, protection. You know, he got and, sacked and not the greatest set of receivers either. Yeah. The Braylon Edwards that – you know, if they had hit with that Braylon Edwards signing, it would be a really interesting team. But, you know, this was a year where any free agent receiver – did any free agent receiver pan out? I'm trying to think. It's like all of them were lemons this year. Yeah, I mean, you know, pretty much everyone uh, Rice you know, went sucked. back to his original team. Santonio, obviously, well, was a pretty miserable failure. Lee Evans. Lee Evans was, Lee Evans was a trade, was a, but it was, you know, he the the same thing. Yeah, year. acquisition. Who else? Uh yeah, no, nobody really made it. But anyway, all right, Bill Barnwell. So your favorite pick around one is pick pick against the spread or pick straight up. Spread against the spread. I'm going to say Broncos. I think Broncos is going to get to ten. And uh, I, I'm, you know what? I'm going to say I'm all in with Tim Tebow. Uh, why not? I, I mean, there it you're is. Ever going to be? I feel like I'm just going to be happy about it. You know, like, like I don't want to be rooting yeah. against Tebow in the playoffs. <sighs> He was so bad in that Week 17 game. I wish he had just <laughs> sure even was. been like – I wish he'd even been passable. That was really one of the worst quarterback performances I've ever watched. I don't totally blame him because his receivers are so bad. But, uh, man, he just he, – there are a couple of wide open guys and he's just not even close. And not even in the vicinity. Uh, I hope you're right. It would be fun if Tebow at least made it interesting for – so that in the fourth quarter stuff was happening. Bill Barnwell, you're writing uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for Grantland.com. Big playoff preview on Friday. I look forward to reading it. We'll talk to you next week. I'll talk to you next week, Bill. All right. Before I get the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.